Uh, so today our presenter is Sylvia Phillips from Skills USA. Prior to joining Skills USA education team in 2018 as the senior manager for membership growth and development, Sylvia worked in her home state of Georgia within career, technical, and agriculture ed education for more than 20 years, serving eight years as the state coordinator for career and technical student organizations for the Georgia Department of Education. Sylvia loves the intentionality of the Skills USA educational resources and programs, which all focus on the st strategic development of career readiness skills. The focus of her work is professional development for educators. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sylvia. And just a quick reminder, uh, if everybody could say hello in the chat box. And if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sylvia. Awesome. Thanks so much, James and Robert. I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you here today. And thanks for carving out time on a Friday for some professional development. It speaks highly of you and of your commitment to your students. So we're going to launch right in today with a, a learner profile. I'm placing this on the screen. I'd like you to read over this profile and then answer the question in the chat. Let's see if we can determine what career readiness skills are important for Lindsay to have in her computer coding job. So take a look at this slide and, and read this profile. Give us some answers there. What does Lindsay need to be successful? You can drop those answers in the chat. All right, Nicole, thanks for starting us off right there. We see communication and critical thinking, absolutely. Someone's thrown out, uh, Linda says soft skills, thinking about problem solving skills. Yes, and so many things fall under that umbrella of soft skills, right? Or some people will call them employability skills or career readiness skills. Yes, a good use of technology, absolutely. And I see again and again, we're listing communication there in the chat. So 100% agree, these are some things, some employability skills, some workplace skills that Lindsay needs to be successful in this position that she's taking. Let's try another one. I'm gonna place a new learner profile on the screen. Take a look at what career readiness skills you would recommend for Ray as he pursues a role as an EMT. Thanks, Maria. She started us off. She says leadership skills are going to be important. And Yvonne quickly coming back with some technical skills. Absolutely, knowing CPR is going to be important. And I see some resonation around the idea of the, the customer service component, right? That compassion and the people skills that Ray is going to need as, as well as his um, communication and having that empathy there. Excellent, excellent, yes. We're right on target here. These are the skills that these two learners are going to need for success. And I appreciate your engagement there in the chat. I want you to keep it going throughout our session today. Let's be very interactive and learn from one another today. That'll help us all. As we think about these two learners in particular and the learners that we serve, we know that while we come from different places, we're serving in different parts of the country and we represent different programmatic areas, that these are necessary skills for success. The same skills often needed, transferable for whatever we'll do next. And, and we've mentioned several of those in the chat, the teamwork, the leadership, the communication, critical thinking, these things are gonna be important these types of skills. And at Skills USA, we enlisted the help of some research and a company called Quintessential Careers. They surveyed a thousand different business and industry partners nationwide. And they asked, what do your employers need to know, your employees rather, need to know and be able to do to be successful? 
And the results of those surveys, of those interviews, were the 17 essential elements that you see on the screen now. This is our Skills USA framework, and these are the 17 essential skills that were given to us by business and industry partners via that survey and research that our, our team conducted. Um, we divided those 17 essential skills into three components, and you see them listed on the screen in those colored ribbons, personal skills, workplace skills, as well as technical skills grounded in academics. So beyond those technical skills that we often focus on in our classroom, thinking broadly now to what are the skills that um, will help our students to be successful overall. Even if they don't know exactly what they want to do next, we hear from business and industry, all different kinds of industries, these are the skills needful for success. And even more now, we're hearing business partners saying we will focus on those job specific skills after a person's hired. We might even be willing to give additional funding to help them attain a different certification that will help them be successful once they're hired. But they are looking to us as educators to help our students prepare themselves with some of those other skills that you have been calling out earlier in the chat. So as you think about the students you serve, you represent a lot of different areas come from lots of different parts of the country. And you're it, looking over this image, what would you say are the most important skills for your students? Would you list that in the chat? Let's see for your students that you serve, what are the most important skills they need for success? Okay. Awesome, I see you pulling out some things from the framework and some of you classifying by component even. You just say, oh, I love all of the information there in the personal skill component or, oh, the, those workplace skills are really resonating with me. And I, I'm so glad to hear that you feel affirmed that these are the right skills. That's why we introduced the framework to our educators in 2014. This is a way that we are very intentional very strategic about our methodology in our education and in our Skills USA work across the nation. We say it gives us a common language. So this is the language of business and industry. And now we as educators are able to articulate this language to help our students express what they're learning in the classroom. And so this is the way that will allow our students to grow and develop and, and to become those distinctive employees that are being looked for all over the country now. So we recognize there's a skills gap in technical skills. There's also some skills gap in some of these other areas. And, and this is our opportunity now to help our students in a very strategic and intentional way and point back to the framework. So there are many strategies that we could employ for teaching employability skills. There are many instructional strategies, many different kinds of methodologies that you may be choosing to employ with your students. And as we go through this um, time together today, we wanted to focus on project-based learning and project-based teaching strategies. At Skills USA, we really believe that this is one of the most effective ways. Project-based learning really reaches to the heart of the, the student goals for key understanding um, as well as successful learning objectives there. And so you're probably pretty familiar with project-based learning. That would be my guess. This, is the, uh, this image comes to us from pblworks.org, pblworks.org. And I'm gonna drop that in the chat if I can type in uh, and talk at the same time, pblworks.org. Um, the Buck Institute of Education put forward these seven teaching practices that you see. And, and we're gonna go through that. I'd love to hear um, your description of how would you describe project-based learning? Give me some words that you use to describe it. If someone said to you, what is project-based learning? I'm, I'm not familiar with that terminology. How would you respond? It allows our students to be active, yes. Relevant, it's bringing a, a practical application. It's often hands-on, Karen, yeah, right on, right on. And they're giving that real life application to work. You took the words right out of my mouth in the chat there, and I love that. Yes, so let's explore these seven teaching practices of project-based learning. I'm thankful that you have that understanding of, of project-based learning. 
And let's think about it in the context of what we're doing. This is a, a great time of year for us to reflect on what we've been doing, those of us who have been in education for a while. And let's think about, okay, what aspects of project-based learning am I really familiar with and, and where do I have the opportunity to grow as an educator? So our first teaching practice is design and plan. And so I would encourage you this year to be thinking about the content that perhaps you've been teaching for quite some time now, and how could you um, bring it to life in a new way? What are the projects that you could put together for your students? And, and maybe that means asking some former students to, to weigh in. What is something from pop culture, perhaps, that you could bring in to create a project that's going to bring that technical content to life? As, as a, an example resonates with you on one of these teaching practices, you've got something cool that you're doing and you want to drop it in the chat for others as a sharing point, I invite you to do that. But I would encourage you, think about that content and, and a project that you could share with your students and how would you design it to help them be more engaged. That's really our goal, where they're taking a concept they don't know much about and they're putting it to practice with an experience. And that would bring it out in a, in a way that would be more engaging and more relatable for the student. And when they hang that, that learning onto an activity, statistics say that they are more, um, more likely to remember it, right? Our second teaching practice of project-based learning is aligning to standards, aligned to standards. You're probably really familiar with your technical standards of your course or the academic standards of your course, but what about the employability skills standards? How is that woven in to your curriculum? And how could you be more intentional to weave in the employability skill development with the um, con course content standards that you're already working through? I would encourage you, as you look to align to standards, um, let's, let's be sure that our learning goals are not a mystery to our students. For example, if, if you're going to reinforce those math skills, finding area, uh, finding perimeter, using fractions, perhaps is there something that they they could build and now we're working on that job specific skill and we're bringing it to life but as a part of that could we talk about an employability skill that might fit hand in hand what about we could talk about safety and health as a part of that process when our business partners gave us those 17 essential elements that you saw in the framework, the education experts at Skills USA took each of those 17 skills and developed competencies at three levels, exploratory, fundamental, and advanced. What are the behaviors? So not just the definition of what these employability skills are, but what should a learner be able to know and do when they are demonstrating that skill successfully. And, and those are the kinds of things that you wanna really be thinking about this year. So what are the skills I wanna see demonstrated? Not just a, a repetition of a definition, right? We wanna go deeper in the learning of, of those skills. Our next teaching practice is build the culture. And when we think about this, it's, it's a wonderful aspect of project-based learning. And I noticed mentioned in the chat there, the opportunity for learners to work independently. The opportunity for us to provide as educators some open-ended questions so that the learners are exploring the concept through an experience that you're providing there in your classrooms. We want our students to know this is a safe place to take a risk. This is a place where you can ask questions. It's okay to fail and we'll try again, right? The first time we might not get it right. And, and that's why we're in this course together because we're exploring. And so I hope that this year you will think about new ways to encourage your students to be risk takers. That's all part of thinking critically, isn't it? And several of you listed the value of critical thinking in the classroom. So I would encourage you to create that healthy atmosphere where students are encouraged to ask questions and develop their own personal beliefs about these, uh, these skills. So why do I think integrity is important? Where have I seen conflict arise when the essential element of integrity was missing? These are some of the questions that we want to weave into our students' experiences.
What do you notice about the four bullet points on the slide here? This is a teaching practice of manage activities. And what do you notice common about all four bullet points of this description? What do you see there? Work, yes, it might not be easy. Work with, work with who? Yes, work with students. That's absolutely right. Some instructors tell me they're a little nervous about project-based learning, that it seems a, a little bit out of control sometimes, right? Um, but really, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to build those transferable skills for your students because they are going to need to be able to organize tasks on their own, to think critically to what is the next step that's important in their jobs. Um, it's important for them to be able to, to manage their own schedule. So we as educators, as we manage activities. We want to engage our students in that. So let's definitely set forth a calendar, have some deadlines. Let's absolutely um, be flexible in nature, right? When we come to a concept that we thought we were going to breeze through in one lesson and, and we realize, no, they weren't quite ready for it. Perhaps their background didn't bring them to the same place at the same level. And we'll, we'll slow down a moment and come around that concept again. You know, the ability to manage your own activity is really appealing to adult learners because they're often balancing work life, family life, as well as their educational experience. And so I believe that you're going to be empowering them when you give them a voice and how they will manage the activities. And, and I wanted to recommend to you, what about how they deliver the concept back to you? Um, perhaps some would choose a writing assignment. Some might choose an audio recording of themselves and what they learned through the experience. Some may choose to do something creating with graphics. And if we can um, help them manage their activities and give them different ways to even submit their work, they're going to be more engaged in the learning. And it becomes more relevant to them as they're able to use their own gifts and talents and their own creativity. As we think now about our next teaching practice, um, you see that ladder on the screen. Uh, the image that pblworks.org chose for scaffolding of student learning. A and I love that imagery there because as educators, we know that our learners are coming to us with different backgrounds of experience. Some come to us with language barriers. Some come to us with technology challenges. And it is, it is our great privilege to think about how am I going to deliver this concept in a way that is going to appeal and meet the needs of all of my learners, right? And so it kind of links back to design and plan when we're thinking ahead about what questions would be asked and, and what things would we need to clarify. When we think about this teaching practice, we think about chunking of times and chunking of concepts. That allows us to be more flexible. That allows us to pivot when perhaps a concept isn't grasped with the timeline that we thought it would be. Um, I would encourage you when you think about this um, to really encourage again those questions, um, a safe place for the students to ask questions. And, and it really leads us into this next teaching practice, assessing student learning. So in project-based learning, we're not just assessing the product at the end, right? We want to be uh, thinking about the process of learning, right? So what are the assessment points all along the way? And so as you think about some of the uh, assessment tools that you presently employ in your classroom, I'd love for you to drop those in the chat. There's been such good wisdom here in the chat. I see it there on the side that people are, are chiming in and giving wisdom from their experience and that is helpful. And save those chat messages. That'll, that'll be a good tool for you moving forward. But when you think about scaffolding of student learning, I would really encourage you to think about formative and summative assessments. Um, could there be the opportunity for students to be involved in some journaling? Could there be the opportunity to work with a partner um, where we have some partner share of what I learned? Could we reflect and could we give them some prompts um, where they would fill in a statement based on what they have learned and, and what they understand? And, and yes, those, those exit ticket out the door, those are, are wonderful ways for us to get some just-in-time check-ins before they get to the end and have to take that final assessment. And so I, I, I 
I, I see there are some great things. Even just a thumbs up on the Zoom screen will help us to give that, um, that check-in, that everybody is doing okay, and that we're tracking with the content that is being delivered. Our last teaching practice of project-based learning as defined for us by PBL Works is engage and coach. And, and perhaps this is the reason you became an educator because it is that opportunity to give back, right? It is that opportunity for you to be able to invest and that someone might learn from your experience and that is um, that aha moment, right? That light bulb that comes on and then you say, um, you know, you realize that you made that connection and the student gained and that understanding. In this aspect of project-based learning, this teaching practice brings to light that teachers become facilitators. Uh, Dr. Tim Elmore says all the information they need is in this device that they hold in their hand. We as educators become the interpreters of that, that information. We help them discern relevance in information and to gain new information and to learn how to apply it in a way that's going to be practical for their future. And so as you think Think about the, uh, the engagement component, I would encourage you um, to often dig into deep conversations with students. Take those opportunities to pause, because really isn't our goal the learning objective, right? That they really grasp it, not to just move through our pacing guide in a way that seems automated, but to, to ensure that our students will find success. And, and sometimes that in this new environment, that may include we're gonna schedule some one-on-ones or, or perhaps that means um, some alternate ways. I'd love for you to drop in the chat. How are you connecting with your students now virtually? What are some of the creative creative things that you're doing in this virtual environment to ensure that you're able to engage with them. We know that they're looking to us um, to be that support in, in many of, of our, our students are balancing a lot of challenges and it's, it, they need us. They need our support more than ever before. We're going to pause right here and my friend James is going to place a poll up on the screen so that you can share what uh, teaching practices of project based learning are you presently employing. So I'll put the slide back up there on the screen and this will give you a one question poll so you can give us a little feedback as to what teaching practice of project based learning do you presently employ in your classroom and you say uh, this is one that I feel really good about and, and go ahead and select that on your screen now. Let's get some answers populating. James, we've got a couple folks saying they don't see the poll. I see it on my side. We might need a little additional direction and maybe you see the results coming in. You give us some tech support there. I do see it on my end and I, yeah, it is okay. uh, being well attended to. Awesome. Your poll should pop up on your Zoom screen. For some of you, you have to go down to the, the toolbar where it says more in order to um, gain access to that poll, depending on the version of Zoom that you have on your device today. We'll give it just a couple more seconds and then we'll close out our poll and take a look. Uh, James will be able to share it with us so we can see the percentage uh, of the answers and what teaching practices of project-based learning are you most comfortable with and presently employing in your classroom. James, let's take a look.
All right, you should see those results there on the screen. It looks like we've got folks in every category represented there with our project-based learning teaching practices. So that's awesome, that's awesome. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you feel like, okay, there were some of those teaching practices that I feel very familiar with, or perhaps it is a natural bent in my personality, but Sylvia, there's one or two things there that I haven't considered, or I haven't really invested much time and I'm going to go to that website, PBL, pblworks.org, and I'm going to do a little more investigation and see if I can't gain some additional knowledge. I would encourage you to do that. Um, thanks so much for sharing that on the screen, James. We're going to move ahead, and I want to show you some examples of um, some project-based learning activities that we use here at Skills USA. So we're going to take our Skills USA framework that we introduced at the beginning, so the intentional, strategic, tool that we use to teach employability skills in our classrooms and we're going to combine that with those seven teaching practices um, because I want to share a couple of examples with you. So first if you'll drop in the chat what are the age of the learners you serve? So if you guys could give me a picture of the ages of the learners you serve that would be wonderful. I, I'm curious as to the um, how young they go and maybe that upper age group there to make sure that I have chosen the correct example for you. I wanted a little confirmation there. I think we've got it. Awesome. Awesome. So at SkillsUSA, we have a project-based learning curriculum called the Career Essentials Suite. And the Career Essentials Suite is really made up of four courses and they are age banded. Um, none of the courses are prerequisites to any of the other courses, but it is project based learning. And as you probably guessed, it is sourced in that Skills USA framework. So those 17 essential elements of the framework are represented throughout each of these four courses. So I thought it since we were having this conversation about teaching employability skills, it might be helpful to share uh, a couple of examples with you uh, with, of some of these project-based learning um, activities that we do with our students at Skills USA through this curriculum. So I am going to drop into the chat a link uh, that should share with you um, of the example that I'm going to place on the screen. This is one example of one of the activities in the adult learner curriculum of our Career Essentials Suite. You can see here at the top the essential element that is targeted in this assignment is self-motivation. This image here at the top left hand corner looks like a paper airplane and a star that tells us that this activity is part of the capstone project that students would create as a part of that course at, with Career Essentials. So they're building a capstone project that includes a resume, a cover letter, and a 20 question interview with a business and industry partner. And this is one of the activities. So in this activity, students are asked to develop a career plan to really be intentional and thinking about what career are they interested in pursuing and what is the path that is going to get us there. And so I've divided this image into several different slides so that you could take a look at it. And um, yes, I dropped that link in the chat so that you could open it up on your screen and, and have it to look in a larger way. And we'll make sure that you get a copy of that as well. So in this career path opportunity, students are first asked to think about where they are presently and what is in their background of experience. So what are their personal interests? What are the things they naturally love to do? What are they strong in, right? Our strengths and weaknesses. And maybe they've taken an assessment that helped outline their strengths and weaknesses. This also asks about their employment history. So where has their experience lied, um, landed uh, to presently? And then it also um, asks them to talk about their education. And that is also outlined here in this plan. I am noticing that I had just the panelists there, James. So I'm dropping that link again. Thank you for those notes in the chat for all panelists and all attendees. Now everybody should be able to access it. Sorry about that. The second portion of this activity asks students to now 
think ahead. And so students are going to develop SMART goals, and you can see they're timelined out there in this sheet, uh, three to six months uh, goals, and they get longer, so some short, mid, and long-term goals for these students. And they're going to think about what skills do I still need to acquire? So they've done some research about the career field of interest, and now they're going to think critically, okay, so how do I get from where I am knowing what I have in my toolkit to where I want to be in this career. And so now we're really thinking ahead and boy, don't I wish somebody had had done this with me when I was about uh, 17 or even just a little beyond. Sometimes when you see a worksheet like this, you think, okay, I can't quite wrap my head around what it would look like in actuality. So I wanted to share with you an example that one of our students submitted. So in this example, um, this student has listed, you can see there their interests. They like public speaking. They like writing. They like teaching. They believe that their strengths are around communication and that they say they are self-motivated. So they've used some descriptions there as well as listing out their employment history. And it looks like they've had uh, quite a lot of different kinds of experience in their employment history. And then they outlined their goals. So they started to break down that journey. So if I wanna to get to that end goal career, what am I gonna do first? What's my first step? And so that was helpful there for the students to outline. And then what are the additional competencies that I need to attain? On the bottom half, they listed their action plan. So these were five steps that this student identified that they would need to do in order to reach that goal as part of their career plan. And so in this way, this student has created a very usable, very practical tool to help them achieve the goals on their list. And I see some people are like, oh, I love this and, and this is great. And so I'm, I, I'm so glad to hear that that resonates with you. And so in the blue bubble, you see a little question there that I'll throw out to the crowd now to see how could you integrate this activity in your course content. Could you envision yourself using this? I, I'd, I'd love to hear that if you think this would work with your learners. Um, I hope so. Okay, Joyce says yes. Karen says she could see using this at the beginning of the year. As you're thinking about perhaps some of you have a section where you're working on resumes. Oh yes, um, Pamela said resume right there. Um, this would be a nice companion there for the resume. If you have a, a capstone time or a, that would be a great contributor for your capstone piece or maybe you do some mock interviews and the knowledge that they gain from that partner in the mock interview could help contribute to create creating the plan. So it's really exciting to think about all the variety of ways that you could implement a tool like this. And this would, I, I agree, that would help them to get unstuck if they feel like I don't exactly know what to do next or if they feel discouraged in their process right now. I think we have enough time in our session to take a look at another example of another um, activity that we use and it comes out of that career essentials curriculum that I mentioned our project based learning curriculum. Um, and so let's take a look at another one y'all want to look at another one, let me see if I can drop another link. Uh, make sure I have all panelists and all attendees listed there my friend James may have to help me if I make sure that I do this correctly I'm going to drop you another link link and so you're going to get another example of an activity that would be useful for you I hope as we think about how do we employ methods that work to teach employability skills which is our goal in our session today right so this is an activity out of our adult learner experience in the career essentials cur curriculum you see this one is highlighting adaptability and flexibility and wow in this pandemic haven't we all learned this, right? We've all had to learn to adjust and be a little more flexible. We thought we were flexible before, but we have really been tested now. And um, I, I'm excited to say this is one of our essential elements of the SkillsUSA framework, adaptability and flexibility. So in this activity, resolving workplace challenges, students are gonna work in a group in this activity. And they are going to think about a workplace challenge that they are presently experiencing. 
Now, certainly you could spin that based on what you know about your learners. Uh, you could think about what is a, a challenge that we're experiencing in our classroom or what is a challenge that you anticipate, or, or we could look at some articles to learn about some challenges that are perhaps taking place, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you could um, contextualize even those instructions in the overview. But basically what's going to happen is you take a look at, at the link that I provided. Um, they're going to brainstorm with their partner. Uh, what are the different solutions? We often know there's more than one right way to address a challenge. And that is true in the workplace. And so we're gonna have them brainstorm and, and to really think about all of the different types of solutions that they might come to. And then they're eventually going to have to choose and taking that one assignment, that one solution, they're going to come up with a plan. They're really gonna dig in, they're gonna take that learning deeper, and they're gonna develop a robust plan for how to make this solution um, turn to action. And then moving beyond that, they are going to be asked to share that with the other students in the class. So now we have the opportunity for them to communicate their answer, to communicate their solution, and to be able to do that well is an important and transferable skill. And so we, we have that listed here. Um, it gives them so, some questions for you um, that they could be asking of their partner um, as they articulate the, the solution. And uh, certainly there'd be some opportunity for people to give feedback in that process. And you could do this in person. You could certainly do this in a, in a virtual platform as well. Again, I, I like to give some concrete examples that, that helps me in the way that I process new ideas or new activities with my learners. So I wanted to share some real experiences that some of our students had with this activity. And so on the screen now, you see three different groups of students and the different challenge that they were addressing based on their background of their program area. So in the first example, these were students who were EMT students and they were doing some rotations at the emergency room and they would actually get to go in and assess patients. And what was happening with these students is there was no good tracking mechanism. So oftentimes patients would be visited by more than one intern. And oftentimes those patients are being asked the same questions again and again. And that was causing the patients to feel a little uneasy. Why, why am I being asked the same? questions and perhaps even a little annoyed that they're being asked the same questions. So these students brainstormed a solution and the one that they landed on was that they would have a clipboard at the nurse's station and they designed a form whereby the patient's name, the room number, and the time of assessment as well as the intern's name would be listed. And this would prevent the overlap and everybody would have a common and central place that they could look for that sheet to prevent that obstacle or that challenge in the future. So what seems like a very elementary idea um, was not taking place in that environment and, and that led to more successful experience for all of the interns and more positive feedback from the patients about their experience. In example two, these engineering students said they have a lack of funding for their program. And when they were brainstorming what to do about that, they actually landed on three potential solutions. One was that they would apply for grants specific to the engineering program that they were a part of. The second was they could secure local sponsors from their community. And so an awareness to local sponsors and how would that perhaps bring in some financial contributions to help support their engineering program. Program. And then the last was they could host a fundraiser. And that is actually the one that they selected as their, their move forward. And they took the fundraiser idea and they came up with a robust plan for what would the fundraiser look like? What are the details? What was the timeline? And, and that is the way that they, um, that was the solution that they brought forward there. Also, in the final example, this was poor communication. So we had some students working in the restaurant environment, working on different shifts. There would be situations where challenges would come up between managers and staff in one shift and resolution would be made as to how we're gonna handle that certain situation. But then that was not communicated to other people working in other shifts, right? And so oftentimes the communication was broken between the various teams, even in the same 
restaurant simply because they didn't work from the same um, sh this on the same shift with one another. It was also causing a disconnect between the shifts. So if occasionally someone who works mornings now goes to work evenings, and there's a process that's handled differently in the evening than in the morning. And so that was um, the challenge that these students took on as a part of this activity, resolving workplace challenges. And the way that they uh, came up with that they would solve that challenge is that they created a digital notebook. And this digital notebook was documenting the questions that the staff had for the managers. Managers would either respond as to the appropriate protocol, or perhaps if a meeting had to take place, the um, action items from the meeting were then listed. And so that was also something that was really um, helpful for this team. And so this was a good opportunity here for these students to, to get to see that the tools they created could actually work when they took it back to their workplace or into their classroom, as in the example of the engineering program. So I'm going to pause right there because I would like to scale your opinion and, and get some feedback from you um, about how effective could you envision this activity in your classroom. So on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being very effective, I would love for you to share how effective do you believe this activity would be with your learners? Okay, looks like several of you think that these might be things that you would use. I'm glad to hear that. So glad to hear that. Awesome. Good stuff, good stuff. Again, I wanted to just remind you that these two activities were pulled from the Career Essential Suite curriculum. As you can see on this image, the framework is the um, highlight of that uh, work. It is the foundation for all of our work in Skills USA. In this project-based curriculum, this is the way that we teach employability skills to our students. Um, one way that we do that is, is through our Career Essentials curriculum. It is the opportunity for students to progress through these courses. Um, they complete assignments online, they upload their assignments online, and then at the end they have a post assessment. And if they pass that post assessment at 80% or better, you see they have the opportunity to earn either a micro credential or the full industry recognized career essentials credential. And so in addition to a technical credential that they might be earning in your program, they they would also have the opportunity to earn a credential specific to the employability skills that were listed in the framework. And so this is a, an excellent opportunity for some students to, to show forward their hard work and their dedication to um, learning and being proficient and excelling in not only defining employability skills, but also that they are going to demonstrate these skills um, for success in the workplace. And when we talk about industry recognized credentials, sometimes people say, well, what industries are there? And uh, that what industries are recognizing this? So these are a list of our partners with SkillsUSA who have contributed um, either financially or with in-kind donations and partners who are saying, yes, we believe the SkillsUSA framework, these are the right skills and we believe that the career essentials uh, credential is valuable for students to achieve so I wanted to share that with you and in the event that you were looking for something specific to employability skills I'm putting my information up there on the screen now in the event that you have some questions or want to have some continued conversation about these tools that we shared today and also um, I need to ask my um, companion Jane there if he would share some questions that may have come forward in the Q&A that we haven't addressed as we were moving through. We've got just a few moments here now at the end of our session. Happy to take some questions. I'm going to stop my screen share there. I noticed um, someone said, where could I find some more information about Career Essentials? So I'll drop that website in the chat, careeressentials.org. And so James, what kinds of questions do we need to take a look at today? So we've got a few, few questions. I'll, I'll just start off the top. Can you share the project-based learning link again? I got lost in the chat. So maybe if you can post that in the chat section again. 
absolutely. I'll do that right now. Thank you for that. That chat does get going really quickly, doesn't it, when we've got a lot of folks on the line. So let me drop that there for you. Here's the link to creating a career plan. Okay, marvelous. Great. Uh, the next question is somebody's asking if you can email it to them directly. Um, do you want me to mark their email address and send that to you on the side? Yes, that would be perfect. I'm very happy to do that, to okay. send you that information. Also, I would encourage you, I put our website there in the chat. It is careeressentials.org. When you go to careeressentials.org, you'll have the ability to actually do a, take a demo um, on any of these courses. So you could choose adult learner and you could go to the demo and you would find those same activities that I shared with you there, as well as an example of the e-module. You'll see a learning map for the course as a whole. So that might be another place that you would want to investigate that. Um, I, I noticed somebody had also mentioned some of those images. They'd like to see that. And so at careeressentials.org would be a great place for those of you who are interested. Great. Uh, the next question, is this program paper-based or computer-based? So the career, uh, the career Essential Suite is project-based learning and it is completely housed in an online platform. The learning management system is called Absorb. And so it is absolutely online. There are e-modules as well as PDF activities like the ones that we looked at. Um, students would access it through their online account. Um, they certainly could print it off. You certainly could print them off. The beauty that I love about it, students have their own electronic transcript and they are building their own transcript. They can see what they've completed. They're gonna earn digital badges for every unit they complete in those courses. So um, yes, it's completely housed in an online platform, but those resources could be, those PDFs could be downloaded if a student prefers that. Excellent. Uh, next question, is Skills USA something we have to purchase? So Skills USA is a partnership of teachers, uh, educators, uh, students, as well as business partners. And you join as members. Uh, you can join as a professional members of Skills USA. I can, uh, skillsusa.org is our website. I'll drop that in the chat as well. So um, yes, you could join our organization as a member. You don't have to be a member to utilize our curriculum. You could purchase the curriculum for yourself or for your students without being a member. Great. And is there a cost for the Skills USA certificate? So I think that question might be asking about earning that credential for the course. So if I am not answering the question that you asked, <laughs> um, circle back and ask it again in the Q&A. Um, so you would purchase the curriculum and if your students are interested in earning the credential, I would recommend you purchase a curriculum bundle. The bundle would be a pre-assessment, the full course and a post assessment. So you'll have that measurable data bookend there, pre and post assessment. And for the adult learner curriculum at present, um, because of the generous donations and sponsors, our partners who have sponsored this curriculum during this pandemic, you are able to purchase that adult learner bundle for $20 per student. Great question. Right. And if I, I if that wasn't your question, <laughs> circle back to me again with that. The credential is earned when a student completes the course, upload all their assignments, and pass the post assessment at 80% or better. Great. We've got a few more here. Sure. Um, so what about format for prison or jail classes? Can this be non-computer or non-internet based? Great question. So um, when the pandemic first started back in the spring, we had several um, school systems and several of our users tell us they had students who did not have internet access. So a few things about that. Some had Chromebooks that they, so this students could access the curriculum on their phone, on their tablet, on their computer. And so we had some systems who were downloading the curriculum on their Chromebook, and then they would send the device home with students who didn't have internet. The students would work at home offline 
online and then those devices were brought back to the school reconnecting with the internet to upload the pieces there. Um, we have been in conversations with several correctional facilities who felt like this would be a great tool for the reentry program, especially. Um, we have not have, we do not right now have anyone who is presently using it in the, in the correctional centers, um, but yes, we are certainly willing and, and interested in engaging in that conversation with you. And so again, I will put my email in the chat. It's um, S. Phillips, Sylvia Phillips, S. Phillips at skillsusa.org. So happy to have a conversation about that. Great. In an ESL or GED class, students may all have different areas of work experience and goals. Any specific suggestions for that kind of class? Yes. So Skills USA serves students from 130 different occupational areas. So when we talk about those seven teaching practices of project-based learning being employed in this curriculum, one, that first one, design and plan, that was a key component because we wanted to be sure that this curriculum would be relevant to learners from a variety of different pathways, a variety of different programs. So for example, there is a unit called reliability in the fundamental mental experience, students will create a video on what does it mean to be reliable. And they're talking about it from the perspective of integrity, professionalism, and responsibility. So if I was a healthcare student, I could address my video from the context of what does it mean to be reliable in a global health pandemic? And I could talk about CDC guidelines and social distancing, about the value of wearing a mask, and, and I could go from that perspective. If I was a culinary arts student and I'm doing a video on what does it mean to be reliable, I might talk about the value of those catered events that we would participate in. And I've got to know what day and what time. I need to go and be dressed appropriately. I need to be reliable that I have, um, I have my clients' um, requests in mind, that I have created the kinds of foods in the way that they requested, that it's going to be delivered hot and fresh and things like that. So my video could take a completely different turn based on what I was interested in in my program area. So this curriculum is created so that students get to choose how they want to apply the project or how they want to focus the activity. Excellent. Do adult learners also do exploratory and fundamentals? So we recommend that adult learners do the adult learner course because it is specifically designed with those learners in mind. The adult learner course, the, the others are not a prerequisite to it. I think probably that might be the heart of your question. They do not have to have completed those other courses prior to the adult learner. So in the adult learner experience, the languaging is your coworker, your employer, your um, your HR manager, it might talk about previous military experience and the scenarios, it might be talking about a mother who's returned to work after staying home with children. The scenarios are written with that adult learner in mind, as opposed to say the advanced experience where it talks about your internship, your teacher, your classmate. So the scenarios are very different and the languaging is very different because we wanted the adult learner experience course to feel appropriate for learners over the age of 20. Great. Okay, so we're coming up on our time. We have a lot more questions. So maybe one or two, and then I'll uh, launch a poll. Um, Sylvia, I can email you the list of questions and maybe you can provide answers for those. Absolutely. And then I can post those along with your presentation in this webinar on coave.org if that works yeah. for you. That works for me. And I've listed again, put that screen back up with my email if somebody needs to shoot me an email. Great. So let's just do one more. Uh, would the students who successfully complete the program have an actual hard copy certificate showing they have the actual credential? So students will have um, their own account in the online system and they will have an electronic transcript and yes, they can print the transcript and yes, they can print the certificates and yes, you as the instructor also could print those things for the student if that was needful. They could also take the digital badges that they're earning that are in that online transcript and they can move those into electronic portfolios. We know that those are really popular with people and so and very effective now and so that's uh, that's another thing that is another opportunity that students can do when they have earned those various badges and certifications 
Excellent. Well, we're at our time. Sylvia, that was an excellent uh, presentation, very engaging. Um, I wanna thank you for, uh, for presenting on such an important topic. I wanna thank all of our guests today for joining us. I especially wanna thank uh, Robert and Burlington English for their support and their sponsorship. Uh, without it, we wouldn't be able to bring you these webinars. And I wanna encourage everybody, if you could take a minute to fill out the poll that I just launched, let us know how, uh, how it was today. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Sylvia. And have a great weekend, everyone.